There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. Cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. You will take with the enemy there for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You will take with the enemy there for evil. And you turn it
what you can do, God of wonders, power has no end. Things you've done before, in greater measure, you will do again. Cause there's no reason why you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. Things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save. Oh, things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up. is overcome you've already won God of revival you rose in victory now you see it forever on the throne so wash in my heart Trust in you alone. Cause there's no reason why you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. Oh, things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save. Oh, things are possible. Darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up. God of revival, the hope will rise. Death is overcome. You've already won. God of revival, the darkest night, you can light. in your people come awaken your city oh god of revival pour it out pour it out every stronghold will crumble he that chains it the ground oh god of revival pour it out pour it out come awaken your
Well, good morning, Meadowland Church. Good morning, Meadowland family and friends. Good morning to those joining us out under the tent. It is a beautiful, gorgeous day. Uh, we have a handful here in the building enjoying the AC. I know many out under the tent enjoying the beautiful weather. Good morning to those joining us online. It is a pleasure. However we gather, it is truly a joy to gather together as we make much of the name of Jesus, as we praise God and give Him glory, for He alone is worthy. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm the pastor here, and it's a joy to be together. Uh, if you were with us last week, I, you, you may have noticed I, I wasn't here. I had the opportunity to be on vacation with my family, and it was an absolute blessing. Uh, we had a great, great time away. Um, and while it was a joy to be away, it's always a joy and a blessing to come home as well. Uh, we had a great time. We got to visit a great church out in Florida. And, uh, but again, it's, it's great to be together with you all. And so thank you for joining us. This morning, we're continuing uh, our two-week series called Taste and See. Uh, Sarah Hauser uh, started us in that last week, and she's going to be taking it home. We're so excited to have her here as a reoccurring guest. Uh, and so far, we haven't burned that bridge. She keeps wanting to come back, so that's a good thing. Thank you, Meadowland, for receiving her well. And so I'm excited to hear from her this morning. And I thought it would be fitting, as I was thinking on uh, the message and kind of the heart for the, these past two weeks, uh, it just kept reminding me of, of a prayer that we pray sometimes at the dinner table. 
um, that just invites the Lord into our meals and into our daily lives. And I thought, what a great way to start our morning. And so uh, we typically would only go through the first verse, but I want to read for you the first three verses of this prayer. And it's based on uh, Matthew, give us today our daily bread. Be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. Thy creatures bless and grant that we may feast in paradise with thee. We thank thee, Lord, for this our food, for life and health and every good. By thine own hand may we be fed. Give us each day our daily bread. We thank thee, Lord, for this our good, but more because of Jesus' blood. Let manna to our souls be given, the bread of life sent down from heaven. Will you join with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we gather this morning to hear from you in your word. We gather to make much of your name, for you alone are worthy of all praise. We gather to be encouraged by one another as we point each other to you. Help us to fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Help us to abide in you. As we begin this new week, let today set the events of the week to come. As we gather with your people, as we walk together, no matter how easy or how difficult the past week has been, no matter how easy or difficult the week ahead may be, let us take this time to rest in you, to rejoice in you, Father, to encourage one another to walk in you, and then be sent out to make much of you, Jesus. We love you, and we come here this morning to hear from you and to praise you. In your name, amen. Would you please stand with me if you're able as we join together in praising God through song. Come set the rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wine.
our hope comes from you. Our feet are on the firm foundation of Christ Jesus. Lord, would you lead our hearts this morning? Lord, we want to be in your presence, to be where you are. moments are for you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We we praise you. We worship you, Lord.
Receive our praise and our worship this morning, Lord. Be blessed and honored. We love you today. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Good morning, Meadowland. My name is Jessica Erickson. I'm going to bring you some announcements this morning. Um, most important is Project Just Pack. Thank you so much for everyone who has filled a backpack and brought them up here. It is amazing to see. Um, but what I'm here to share is there are so many kids who have still yet to get a personalized backpack. So out in the lobby, there's the chicken wire, and, and on there are little orange pieces of paper with the names of you know, the details for each child. So please, 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 um, if you haven't already grabbed one, grab a child to fill a backpack for. Um, if you don't have the financial means to do so but really want to personally shop for it, send us an email, info at meadowlandchurch.org, um, and we can make sure to get some funds for you so you can still go and personalize that backpack for a child. Um, 
we really, we've those are backpacks that we've committed to, so we really want to see all of those selected. Um, so you can select the orange piece of paper, and then on the back table, uh, select a backpack for that. Uh, th all the backpacks are due back next Sunday, because then we're gonna start distribu them, distributing them. Also next Sunday, um, we are, going to after church, if you're able to stay, um, packing some other backpacks as well. Um, but our first priority are these personalized backpacks. So again, if you haven't grabbed them, please do. Also, if you really want to do some shopping but just don't have the financial means, send us an email and we'll get you a shopping. All right. Um, August 14th at 6 p.m. is the annual fam family celebration. And I did forget to ask about food. Do we need to bring anything? What? It's a potluck. Smorgasbord. Oh, we love a good smorgasbord. Alrighty, so uh, next uh, Sunday, in two Sundays, August 14th, 6 p.m., family celebration, smorgasbord. Um, find a new recipe. Do you know who has good recipes? Sarah Hauser. I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, so um, we will have some worship, great food, um, just hearing uh, what God is doing in Meadowland and what he has in store for us for the rest of this year. So if you can come, please join with us. Um, there's a lots of other uh, things in your bulletin that you'll find. The bulletins are in the back, also on the website, meadowlandchurch.org. Um, ways to connect in, salt shakers, ladies game night. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, and like I said, Sarah Hauser. Uh, we're excited to welcome her back. Um, I've actually known Sarah for a while <laughs> because she has a great website, sarahjhauser.com, and an email subscriber list. And I've been on her email subscriber list for a while and followed her on Instagram. She sends out some really powerful things, things that I feel like, have you been writing that for me? <laughs> Did you peek into my life and see what I needed at that time? Um, and also, she shares great recipes. So it's really, it nourishes your soul. It, it's, uh, it's some really great things. She has some great studies on her website. So um, if you enjoy her message, I really encourage you to check out sarahjhauser.com. And she did not ask me to do that. I asked if I could do that. <laughs> um, because it really, like I said, it has something that has really... Um, helped me when I've been seeking out some answers. Her email shows up in my inbox, and really, I feel like you're like, did somebody tell her to send that and write that for me? So thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us again, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I bring, like, my whole bookshelf with me here, so. All right. Well, good morning, Meadowlands. It is great to be back with you. Um, again, my name is Sarah Hauser, and I do have recipes on my website, partly because I actually started out, uh, when I started writing, I started out as a food blogger. Um, and so I was just you know, writing recipes, taking food photos, all kinds of stuff. And I, uh, one of the first things that sort of got me to um, sort of take a little bit of a shift to write about faith was trying to reconcile um, what, what does God say about our food? Because I was writing this food blog, and at the same time, I was working for a hunger relief organization, Feed My Starving Children, and I had sort of this dissonance in my head, like, is this okay? You know, I'm creating these recipes, and yet my literal day job is to teach people, uh, to teach volunteers, and to um, kind of educate people about severe malnutrition around the world. And and it led me into this deep dive about what scripture says about food. And so that started several years ago and has become, honestly, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, because I think all through scripture, from the Garden of Eden, Eden until Revelation and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, we see that God shows us his goodness through the gift of food. God shows us his generosity through the gift of food. And it's um, it's just a joy to talk a little bit more about that with you this week. Um, I, uh, my husband and I live about an hour away. As I had mentioned last week, if you were here, we have um, seven-year-old twins, a five-year-old and a seven-month-old, and then a, a crazy dog. Um, so our house and our dinner table is just a, a lot of chaos, um, but it's good, and we're, we're very thankful. 
um, for that. And last week, um, what we talked about in our just two-part series, Taste and See, we talked about um, the way we eat and how our meals help us to remember. And I love the song selection this morning because we just sang so much about the goodness of God, and, and we're talking about what it means to taste and see that God is good. And last week, we talked about this idea of remembrance, and we looked back at Passover and Exodus and this Jewish feast that was instituted to um, help people remember what God did when he passed over the doors and the, the homes of the people who had blood on the doors, the people of Israel, and, and led them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery that they had been in for 400 years. And God commanded his people every year after that to observe this Passover feast and then this whole feast of unleavened bread. And, and he said to this people that when their children ask them, why do you do this? In Exodus 13, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And so that's kind of what we can do through our meals. We talked about communion. We talked about eating around our tables. We talked about prayer before our meals and how all of those are ways that we can remember the goodness of God in the way that we eat. So I want to hold on to that idea of remembrance, and I want us to then think about now what's, we, I want us now to look forward. So in our time this morning, I want us to consider not just how our meals help us remember the goodness of God, but how they can help us anticipate the salvation of God. So through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he's already saved us from the penalty of sin, right? If we trust him, he has saved us through his death and resurrection, and he works on our hearts to make us more like Christ and to save us from this power that sin has over us. And one day we will be saved completely from the very presence of sin, right? So God, this, this process of salvation, while we are saved, God is still working through and bringing that process of salvation to completion. In the meantime, in the meantime, we are supposed to live a certain way, right? And that's what scripture gets at. 2 Peter 3.13 says, According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we're waiting for God to bring about this salvation. We're anticipating this full salvation that he promises. And while we wait, we live in a way that reflects that new life. And this includes the way that we eat. We can eat and drink in a way that gives us a very literal foretaste pun intended, of what's to come when we will actually experience that day when death will no longer have a hold on us at all, when there will be no crying, no grief, no tears, none of that. So our meals, again, not only help us remember the goodness of God, the goodness that he has shown us in the past, but they help us to remember and they point us to the hope that we have in the future. Would you pray with me real quick before we dive in any further? God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the chance to sing about your goodness. We thank you for the chance to look at your word together as a community and to see and to taste that you are good, God. Open our hearts to what you have to say to us. I pray that you will speak clearly through me, Lord, that this will be something that points to you. God, that you will help us to remember that you are good and to hold on to the hope that we have for what you will one day do. In Jesus' name, amen. So there is a, there in, during World War II, there was a concentration camp called Terezin. Uh, I'm, I'm not, probably not saying that correctly. Um, and it often went by its German name, which you'd think Hauser, I would know how to say this, that being my last name, but I don't. But Theresienstadt was a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. It's uh, maybe one of the lesser known ones. I actually didn't, didn't know about this until I had read about it for um, studying this message, but um, it was a camp that the Nazis often strategically used as propaganda, and so what they would do sometimes is they would have um, people come through and they would even film um, what looked like happy people, and they would sort of stage these happy moments and then film that as propaganda and, and send that around to the German people and around the world. So they would create these films to show these supposed good conditions, but of course it wasn't like that, right? Um, and Terezin, this camp often played the role of a transit camp, so many of the people that came through, they didn't necessarily stay there, um, but many of them were actually sent to Auschwitz, um, which if you're familiar was one of the, the worst of the death camps. And in this place, in this camp where death loomed not far away, 
And even despite the propaganda, I mean, this was not, this was not a good place. Uh, this was a place where there was starvation and hunger. There's a group of women, and in an effort to survive, um, in an effort to just nourish their souls in a way, because they were starving, they couldn't nourish their bodies, they actually created a cookbook. And many people couldn't bear to think about the past, and, and they had to just get through the day. But for many, for these women, um, they actually dared to remember. As hunger gnawed away at their bodies, they wrote down these recipes for strudel and vanilla cake and salads and Viennese dumplings. And this act of remembrance, like we talked about last week, it was, it was an act of defiance for them. It was this conscious refusal to let their spirits give up. Despite their bodies being ravaged by disease, starvation, and this unfathomable oppression. So these women gathered any scraps that they could to jot down these recipes, and there's actually stories about how they would argue over certain recipes and the way that it should have been done. Oh, you should cook it this way, no this way. And there's these stories that have come out about how these women would write down these recipes on whatever they could find. And Eventually, kind of almost miraculously, this stitched, hand-stitched together manuscript made its way to the daughter of one of the inmates in the camp. And long story, but it ended up uh, in the hands of this daughter and then also a publisher. And it is um, chronicled in this book called In Memory's Kitchen. And I brought it because I just wanted to show you. And in this, this book, some of the recipes are sort of half-written. You know, you, you can't follow them all completely because, again, they were stitched up on these scraps of paper in the camp. But in the foreword to this book, um, Michael Berenbaum, who is the director of the United States Holocaust Research Institute, he wrote this, recalling recipes was an act of discipline that required these women to suppress their current hunger and to think of this world, to think of the ordinary world before the camps and to perhaps to dream of a world after the camps. Remembering, a we remembering meals, excuse me, was a way to preserve the memory of a past life but it was also a way to keep hoping for a life to come. The daughter of, of this inmate who came into possession of this manuscript, she said, yet here is the story of how the inmates of the camp, living on bread and watery soup and dreaming of cookbook ha cooking habits of the past, found some consolation in the hope that they might be able to use them again in the future. By sharing these recipes, I'm honoring the thoughts of my mother and the others that somehow... And somewhere, there might be a better world to live in. Now, I pray none of us ever know what it's like for these women, what it was like for them to be in this camp. But like them, through our meals, we get to practice this defiant hope. We get to look at the world we live in and all of its brokenness and its grief and the sorrow. And we get to say, through our meals, there's something better to come. So today, we're going to look at quite a few different scripture verses and if you want to just sort of jot things down as I go through, and we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of verses that I, I, you don't have to feel like you need to flip around all over the place, but we're kind of going to ground ourselves in Isaiah 25. So we're going to look at verses 6 through 9, and before I read those, I want to place these in context. So in the book of Isaiah, right before this, there's these words of judgment that God is giving, and right after, there's also more words of judgment. Israel um, disobeyed God, there was wickedness, there was oppression, there was all kinds of stuff happening, and God says that he's, he's going to judge. He's going to judge the world for their sin. And in Isaiah 24, it's an oracle of judgment for all the earth, and it says some pretty rough words that I'm going to read here. It says, there's an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has grown dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. And then a few chapters later in Isaiah 28, God pronounces judgment on Ephraim and Jerusalem, his own people, and his people are depicted as drunkards. Verses Isaiah 28, 7 and 8 says, These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. It's pretty rough. <laughs> These tables, these metaphorical tables that are meant for feasting, are instead filled with the vomit of unrepentant, hardened people who have forgotten their God. 
And instead of using God's good gifts and tasting and seeing that he is good, they used those gifts for their own demise, and they turned away from God. But in the middle of all this, in the middle of these words of judgment, comes this passage. God talks about this great feast that we get to look forward to in Isaiah 25, verses 6. If you want to open your Bibles or scroll on your Bibles, whatever it is, or I think it's on the screen as well, verses 6 through 9 say, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich, marrow full, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from their faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. All the shame, the grief, the tears, this veil that was spread over the nations is swallowed up completely. And God, in the midst of these words of judgment, shows his grace to his people. Instead of being faced with death, this image in Isaiah depicts God's people savoring a meal. Food sustains us, right? Food nourishes us. It provides life. So instead of death, we receive life. Instead of being cast away from God's presence, he welcomes us in. Instead of scrounging around for anything to quench our thirst and satiate our hunger, we're given a feast that is more than enough to satisfy. That's the image that God gives us in Isaiah. That is the hope that we have, and that is the hope that we get to display even here, even now, amidst all of our brokenness. That feasting in Isaiah 25 looks forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb that John talks about in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 19, the Apostle John writes, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. As believers, the church is the bride of Christ, right? And we will one day gather together and savor that marriage supper. We will join in the celebration and be part of that worshiping multitude. So that's what Isaiah points to. That's what Revelation talks about. Until then... Until that day, we get to live as new creation people here and now, holding fast to the promise of what's to come. And through the way that we eat and drink, we get to experience that foretaste and share that foretaste with others. C.S. Lewis, uh, in one of his books, talks about this idea, maybe you've heard him or read him uh, talk about this idea of signposts. And he talks about when we're lost in the woods, the sight of a signpost is a great matter. Right? When we see a signpost, we stop and we read it. But then when we see another one, it points us to what's ahead. Right? We follow these signposts. And then the next one keeps pointing, and the next one keeps pointing. And these signposts keep encouraging the traveler to continue on towards whatever the ultimate destination is. Our meals are a signpost. The way that we eat and drink on our own and together can be a signpost that there's something to come. A meal far more beautiful and satisfying and joyful than we could ever imagine. So how do we eat and drink in a way that points to the kingdom and demonstrates the hope that we have because of Christ? How can we be effective signposts as we gather at the table? There's a lot of different ways, but I want to talk about three. Feeding the hungry, showing hospitality, and then practicing true delight. So feeding the hungry, I saw uh, in your announcements you have a ministry called Salt Shakers, and I love that. And if I understand it correctly, it's, uh, you're collecting food for a local food pantry, if I'm understanding that. And, and that's absolutely beautiful because this kind of thing is exactly what God is telling us to do all through Scripture. Sometimes we can view efforts like this as just a good thing to do. 
But it's so much more than that. It is a good thing to do, absolutely. But it's much deeper than that. Feeding others and providing food for those who need it is not simply our good deed for the day. It's a tangible way we can invite people to taste the goodness and generosity of God. All through scripture, God commands his people to do this. He commands his people to meet the practical needs of others. And he rebukes them when they don't. Leviticus 19, God commands his people to leave leftovers from the harvest for the hungry. Maybe if you remember the story of Ruth, she is actually one who gleans from the fields and she reaps the benefits of people leaving food from the, for the poor because she is the poor. Leviticus 19, 9 says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Then Isaiah 58, God rebukes the people for acting like they're worshiping God through fasting, and yet they failed to love their neighbor. Isaiah 58, 6 to 7 says, Is not this the fast that I've chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Proverbs 14, 31, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about this passage where the sheep and the goats are being separated on Judgment Day. If you want to go back to that passage, It's really a rich passage. And Jesus says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. And then James 2. James 2, 15 to 16, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? All through scripture, Genesis to Revelation, this theme of physically, tangibly, not just metaphorically feeding people, runs through these verses. When we demonstrate When we feed others, we demonstrate our love for God and we show the generosity of God to others and we invite others to taste and see that God is good in the way that we feed. We feed the hungry because we are signposts of what is to come. A messianic banquet, the supper of the lamb, where no one goes hungry, where no one lacks, and where no need goes unmet. That is why we feed the hungry. That is why we do these things not just because it's a good thing to do and it's our good deed for the day, but because that is what God has done for us, right? Secondly, we show hospitality. And there's definitely some overlap here. Feeding the hungry and showing hospitality um, can kind of be one and the same. But sometimes when we think of hospitality, we think about welcoming people into our home, and that's kind of what I want to address a little bit more directly. The first Thanksgiving my husband and I celebrated as a married couple a long time ago. (laughs) I thought it would be a good idea to host our families for dinner. And uh, I grew up with big family feasts. I'm the youngest of six kids, and my parents' best friends growing up had seven kids, and we would do a lot of holidays together, and it was quite a rowdy and raucous time. So that's kind of what I was used to growing up. And so I thought, well, I I need to do that, right? I need to, just having a couple of us in my house doesn't really fit, right? I need a lot of people But the problem was, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and we had no dishwasher. This was not built for holiday, big holiday feasts. Um, But I was bound and determined to make this work. And so on a crisp Thursday in November, we crammed 21 people for a sit-down dinner into our tiny apartment. It was uh, was full. People sat on the couch, on the floor, at this little two-person Ikea table that we had, their plates heaping high with turkey and gravy and stuffing and all the fixins. And while I remember the joy, laughter, and excitement of having our home filled with family and friends, I didn't really understand at the time the significance of actually feasting together. I definitely wanted everybody to feel welcomed, and I wanted to have this time together as a family. But honestly, a lot of it in my head, I thought, I just want to be able to pull this off. Like, that was, in in my head, I was like, I I need to know that I can do this, right? 
over a, a decade later, more than that, uh, I still fall into this temptation sometimes to forget what our feasting is truly about and, and kind of make it around me sometimes. I crave approval and recognition, but if we're to be signposts of the kingdom of God, we don't let our feasts and our meals point to ourselves, right? Our hospitality, our welcoming others into our homes and our lives is not about us. It's about loving God and loving others. We could still serve excellent food, of course. You could pull out the fancy dishes or you could serve pizza, whatever. But our posture of our heart is not self-exaltation, right? It's pointing to this marriage supper of the Lamb. It's pointing to our generous God. For some of us, we might not do this, we might not point to ourselves in sort of an arrogant way, but we make sometimes our meals about us by doing this. And I'm very, very guilty of this. The self-critical among us, we tend to make our feasting about us by disparaging our efforts. We set down that platter of chicken, and all of a sudden we start apologizing over everything that we've done wrong with that meal. Have you ever done that? We say, oh, I'm sorry, this took too long, or this is dried out, or this isn't what I meant it to be. We start doing all this. We confess the meal doesn't look as perfect as we wanted. Or we, or we say sorry a hundred times when dinner takes longer than planned. There may be a place sometimes for apology over our meals, but sometimes, and I, again, I'm so guilty of this, when we are hosting, when we are inviting people in our homes, we do this as a way to sort of control our image. We do this as a way to make sure that people know I'm, better cook, I'm a better cook than this, or I, you know, I, I didn't mean to make these mistakes, or whatever the case may be. But we don't practice hospitality to make ourselves look good. We welcome others in just as God has welcomed us. This truth also frees us from another pitfall that many of us have, and it's this pre-hosting frenzy that we can get in. I wish I could say I don't do this, but I do. And I remember as a kid this pre-hosting frenzy that my mom would get in where you better start cleaning and picking up things and doing what she asked you to do because people are coming over, right? As we clean and cook and prepare, some of us run over anyone in our path who might detract from these goals, right? Our kids, our spouse, anyone who interrupts our effort to get ready for guests. We steamroll those in our own homes showing anything but hospitality to the people closest to us. I am so guilty of wanting to show hospitality to others and failing to show hospitality to my own kids. They don't feel welcome in our own home sometimes because, again, I've made it about me. I've made it about my image. Hospitality isn't about throwing a party. It's welcoming, Romans 15 says, it's welcoming one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And that can happen over a formal dinner table or simply by inviting others to do ordinary life alongside of us. It's an act of service, not a performance. And when we remember that, we can let the little things go. We can do things with excellence, yes, but we can re release this pressure valve on our own expectations. We can stop sacrificing our families to this altar of our own ego and if our kids and our spouses and those in our home and our roommates, they don't feel welcomed and we're, we're, as we're trying to show hospitality to others, we've kind of missed the point. Consider the example of Jesus too, right? Some of us also say, well, I don't have a big enough, big enough house or I don't have this or I don't have that. Jesus showed hospitality and he was an itinerant preacher who never invited people into his house. We don't even know where he lived really, right? But Jesus showed hospitality he hung out with the wrong crowd, even allowing the likes of prostitutes to approach him. He was more concerned about welcoming others into the kingdom of God than impressing those around him. What would our tables look like if we practiced the radical hospitality of Jesus? There's a book called A Meal with Jesus by Tim Chester. I highly recommend it if you want to just look at what Jesus' table fellowship looked like. And he says this, Hospitality will lead to collateral damage. Food will be spilled on your carpet, you'll be left with clearing up, your pantry may be decimated, but remember that God is welcoming you into his home through the blood of his own son. The hospitality of God embodied in the table fellowship of Jesus is a celebration and sign of his grace and generosity, and where to imitate that generosity. What does it look like in your home, in your church, in your community? 
to imitate that generosity. So we feed the hungry, we show hospitality, and we practice true delight instead of making our food and our drink an idol in the form of things like gluttony or drunkenness. We read in, those, in the beginning those passages in Isaiah where God likens the unrighteousness and the lack of repentance of his people to a drunkard, right? At creation, God didn't make a garden with only essentials, right? He gave us far more than we need. And Eden means pleasure or delight. We get to actually delight in the food that God's given us. And it was good. But we have twisted that so often. And again, we've made it about us. Eating and drinking in excess go against the very purpose of our feasting. What we eat and drink turns into an idol. And when we create idols, we've lost sight of who God is and the purposes that he's given us these gifts. Paul writes in Philippians 3.19 that for enemies of Christ, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Now, there's not always a formula to know when we've crossed that line from delight to gluttony or drunkenness, but we, we must practice discernment in how we eat. Are we eating and drinking as if we're enemies of Christ or his followers? When we feast, is our belly our God? Or are we honoring the true God by rightly delighting in what he's given? Gluttony and drunkenness go against the very purpose of our feasting, and we become consumed by what we consume. And when we do that, we've lost sight of God, and we've lost sight of the enjoyment of his gifts. True feasting, truly eating and drinking for the glory of God, depicts not our sin, but our redemption. I want to pause here and just speak for just a a minute for those to whom food and eating can cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of pain. This topic of eating and drinking for the glory of God may feel very foreign because there's disordered eating, there's addiction, there's heartache, there's trauma, there's all kinds of stuff. And I want to pause and just say I see that, I hear that, I acknowledge that. And I just want to speak this word over you briefly. Paul writes in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Whatever you have struggled with, whatever you have wrestled through, know that Jesus still welcomes you to his table. He doesn't shame you. He doesn't shake his head in disappointment at you. He puts his arm around you. He pulls up a chair and he invites you. He invites you to that table with him. And through the spirit and often with the help of resources like counseling and rehabilitation and those kinds of things, Jesus wants you to come to a place where you too can pull up a table to a, a chair to the table with joy and not shame, gratitude and not condemnation. And he wants you through the gift of food to be able to taste and see that God is good. As we think about this um, I want to just share a personal story. And last week I mentioned this briefly about a breakfast that my family shared on the morning my mom died about 10 years ago. It's a meal I won't soon forget because for me it really depicted so much of this idea of anticipating the salvation of God. It showed me the beauty of feasting. About 10 years ago my mom laid in her bedroom. She was in in in-home hospice care and she was dying of pancreatic cancer. And my siblings and I had gathered around her that morning, knowing that this was the end. We knew this was probably the day that she was going to pass away. And knowing that this moment was coming and wishing that knowledge, I wish that knowledge made the process of death a little bit easier, but we know that death is not the way it's supposed to be, right? If you've stood by the bed as someone breathes their last, you know this in the depths of your soul. My mom passed away that morning And a surprising and almost awkward stillness filled those moments after. We didn't have to change her or feed her. We didn't have to fill her pill boxes. We didn't have to wonder how much time that she had left. There was kind of this awkward silence of, what do we do do now? We did the only thing we knew how to do. Shuffled into the kitchen. My brother heated up a cast iron skillet. Someone else began cracking eggs into a bowl and slicing cheese. I'm sure there was bacon being fried, too, filling my family. 
We refilled mugs of coffee and plates clattered as we set the table. We ate. That meal embodies so much of the beauty of eating. We tasted the abundance, provision, and the goodness of God. We saw death, literally just what witnessed death, but at the same time sat down there for a meal and prayed and said, thank you, Lord, for this food. That meal reminded us that we have deep hope in the resurrection. We have this food that sustains our life. We have a God who sustains our life. And as we gathered at the table, we looked forward. Oh, did we look forward to the day, like Isaiah says, when death would be swallowed up forever and we would sit at the table face to face with God himself. Again, going back to our passage in Isaiah 25, verses 7 to 8. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And friends, one day at that great supper of the Lamb, with this eternal exhale and a shout of joy, we will say together, like Isaiah 25, 9, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Friends, this is what we get to do when we eat. This is the hope we can share through our meals. This is the salvation we anticipate as we gather at the table. We taste and see that the Lord is good. We invite people to participate in that feast that is a foretaste of what is to come, a feast that we cannot even fathom. There's a book of prayers, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's called Every Moment Holy that I highly, highly recommend. And in it, there's a a liturgy called A Liturgy for Feasting with Friends. There's quite a few that actually have to do with food that I love. And it's a prayer that captures what it means to look forward to the eternal feast in the way that we eat now. And so I want to close in prayer using a portion of that liturgy. So would you pray with me? To gather joyfully is indeed a serious affair, for feasting and all enjoyments gratefully taken are at their heart acts of war. In celebrating this feast, we declare that evil and death, suffering and loss, sorrow and tears will not have the final word. But the joy of fellowship and the welcome and the comfort of friends new and old and the celebration of these blessings of food and drink and conversation and laughter are the true evidences of things eternal and are first fruits of that great glad joy that is to come and that will be unending. So let our feast this day be joined to those sure victories secured by Christ. Let it be to us now a delight and a glad foretaste of the eternal kingdom. May this our feast fall like a great hammer blow against that brittle night, shattering the gloom, reawakening our hearts, stirring our imaginations, focusing our vision on the kingdom of heaven that is to come, on the kingdom that is promised, on the kingdom that is already indeed among us. For the resurrection of all good things has already joyfully begun. May this feast be an echo of that great supper of the Lamb, a foreshadowing of the great celebration that awaits the children of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah, for bringing us the word. I pray that we'd all be challenged to to live that out and feeding those who hunger and showing hospitality to one another and then finding delight in the Lord. And as we uh, wrap up our time here this morning, I'd invite you all to join us out under the tent uh, for a time to to feast together. Uh, We have no kitchen here, but we can show each other hospitality and welcome one another. Uh, We can encourage one another and find delight in the Lord, and so I'd invite you to do just that. Uh, Whether you're here in person, under the tent, or online, uh, don't forget to grab a backpack, grab a name off the wall, or if you need one sent to you, email us, info at meadowlandchurch.org, and we can line that up this week uh, as we continue just to uh, 
feed in other ways as well to help those who are in need in our community. Uh, so thank you for joining with us in that. Thank you, Sarah, for b- being with us here this morning and last week. It's been a, a real pleasure. Um, one of the things that Sarah talked about, uh, you just heard as far as finding that delight in the Lord. Uh, if you have questions about who Jesus is or how to grow in that relationship with him or taking next steps, a um, couple things you could do. You can fill out the communication card that's in the seat in front of you. We have a digital one on our website as well uh, or on the Meadowland app. You can come talk to me afterwards or really anyone at Meadowland. And if you talk to someone and say, hey, I'm not sure, then talk to the next person. And just, you'll, you'll find someone who can easily help connect you in and, and walk with you in that road of knowing what does it look like to follow Jesus uh, and, and to know him. And so we'd encourage you in that. With that said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you such peace, for you are dearly loved. In the security of that love, of knowing that the Lord has a feast prepared for you and a place of rest and delight, let us leave this place to go and make much of the name of Jesus. You are loved. We'll see you.